so we're going to begin. So here I have a painting of a pair of twins. And that's because this work was, in a sense, inspired by twin studies. So in a twin study, you have two people who are, at least ideally, identical in every way except for one. And what that allows you to do is isolate the effect of the one thing on something else. Here we are interested in isolating the effects of non-cuning charges or non-abelian symmetries on entanglement entropy. So first we had to build a pair of twins and then we could study them. For those who were here uh, last year where I spoke about the koi pond analogy, I hope my analogies are getting better with time and not worse. So you can give, give me feedback on that. Okay, so let me take a giant step back and introduce the subfield that we're working on. And this is non-commuting conserved quantities in quantum thermodynamics. So the subfield originates from introducing a non-classical twist into a very commonplace problem. So across physics, systems exchange quantities, such as energy or particles. If these quantities are conserved globally, we call them charges. So this isn't strictly just electric charge, but it's any globally conserved quantity. Now, an implicit assumption that's often present is that charges commute with one another. For example, this assumption underlies derivations of the thermal states form and the Onsager coefficients, for example. However, if we want to do truly quantum thermodynamics, we have to at least allow for the possibility that charges may not commute. And so we ask the question, well, what happens if they don't? Now, this seemingly innocuous question has spawned a whole subfield of quantum thermodynamics with different results. And I'm going to focus uh, in the introduction on, on two that I think motivate the work we did. And that's two results that suggest non-commuting charges may hinder thermalization. So first, it was shown that charges non-commutation can reduce entropy production rates. So here they looked at a collisional model. And they looked at, so you have two uh, reservoirs from which you're pulling out a subsystem from each. And you apply a unitary on those two. and then send them back into their respective subsystems. And you look at the entropy production generated there. When the action is, obeys a non-abelian symmetry, the rate of entropy production decreases. Another result is this anomalous deviation from the thermal state. So those who are familiar with the, or I guess those who are unfamiliar with the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, or ETH, it's a statement about an observable and a Hamiltonian. When the observable and the Hamiltonian obey the ETH, the long-term expectation value of that observable will equal the thermal expectation value plus some correction. That correction is larger, or at least can be larger, when the charges don't commute. So these are at least two results that suggest non-cuning charges may hinder thermalization. So why would we care about that? Well, one is if we can hinder thermalization, if we can resist the arrow of time in a sense, then we could potentially have a way to leverage that for longer lasting quantum memories or batteries. And if we look at the first point, reducing entropy production rates, I think that may have prospects, or at least we can at least worth looking into the effect of that on quantum heat engines and the efficiency of those at maximum power. Now, this isn't a field that's purely at the level of theory. The experimental testing of these ideas has begun. Uh, so Rainer Blatt's group, and Christian Roos in Innsbruck had did a trapped ion experiment uh, that showed the first experimental test of non-commuting charge physics. Okay, so that's the, the subfield. Where do we come in? Well, we had at least two motivating questions for this work. The first, uh, it's not what I'm going to have for lunch, but the first is, are we comparing apples to apples when studying the physics of non-commuting charges? 
So say I have some system and I want to see, okay, I, I introduced non-cuning charges. How does that change the physics of the setup? Well, non-cuning charges aren't just a switch you can flip on. Maybe I'm introducing other things that are causing the changes that I'm attributing to non-cuning charges. So the first question is, how can we isolate for the effects of charges non-commutation on thermodynamics? The second motivating question comes from knowing a lot about entanglement. So we know that entanglement accompanies thermalization. It's a signature of quantum chaos. It's used for diagnosing phase transitions. So I know there's at least a couple posters here on um, monitored quantum circuits and phase transitions there in terms of entanglement transitions. And it's also a resource for quantum computing in so much as the polynomial amount of entanglement with the system size is necessary for an exponential speed up. So we know all these things about entanglement. We don't know as much yet about non cuning charges. So if we can understand the effect of non cuning charges on entanglement, then we'll know something about the relationship between non cuning charges and all these other interesting effects. So how does charges non-commutation affect entanglement? So these are our two motivating questions. What we did was we first constructed models to isolate the effects of charges non-commutation on average entanglement. So these are the twins I was referring to. We then show that the non-commuting charge model has more entanglement on average. We show this analytically and numerically in two settings, one suggested by more conventional thermodynamics and one in a more quantum setting. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to begin with a page curve background. So that's a tool we're going to use to quantify entanglement, present the analogous models, go through our first comparison in the conventional thermodynamic setting, and then the second comparison in the more quantum one. Then a summary and an outlook. Okay, so for the page curve background, I'm just going to walk through a calculation of a page curve. So this is a way to quantify entanglement in a system. So say I have n d-dimensional sites in some pure state phi drawn from some Hilbert space S. Okay. Now I can break this system into subsystem A with n a sites and it'll be in some reduced state row A. Then I have the remaining subsystem B with its NB sites. The entanglement entropy is the von Neumann entropy of row A. If the two subsystems are entangled, the entanglement entropy will be greater than zero. So the entanglement entropy is a fine measure of entanglement, but clearly it depends on the state phi and on where we cut the system. So to move the dependence on the state to a dependence on the Hilbert space, we're going to har randomly select the state phi, calculate the entanglement entropy, and then average over the different states phi drawn from the Hilbert space. So now we have this average value, which will depend on the, the states from our space. We then take this average value, and we're going to plot it against Na, and ta-da, we have a page curve. So the page curve grows until you get to the mid-size cut, so you've cut the system equally in half, then it peaks there, and then comes back down, and it is symmetric. So this is the unconstrained page curve. So I'm just drawing states from a Hilbert space with no restrictions on it. What we can do is we can fix a charge. So now we don't have this unrestricted Hilbert space, but the states from the Hilbert space, say, have particle number, I don't know, 10 or something. There's some fixing of a charge there. What that'll do is lower the page curve. An intuition for that is you're going to be decreasing the dimension of your Hilbert space when you add this constraint. So you're going to be decreasing the maximum possible value of the entanglement entropy. So it's a bit of an intuition for why it might decrease. Now, say we had multiple charges. So again, we'd expect it to lower. And these charges, let's assume for at first, commute with one another. So we have an abelian symmetry. Now, what if we could flip a switch and make those charges now not commute? 
would we expect the page curve to go further down? Because in a sense, this is like adding another constraint to our system. Maybe we'd further restrict the Hilbert space and the page curve lowers further. Or maybe for some reason, the page curve would move back up towards the unconstrained case. So we're asking if we turn on non-commutation, does the page curve go lower or back towards the unconstrained case? Now, unfortunately, non-commutation isn't a switch that we can flip on and off. So this is why we needed to construct the analogous models. But before I present them, I need to give a, a bit more detail on page curves. So in the unconstrained case, the page curve of a system with local dimension D, and if we're looking at the, the smaller subsystem, so when NA is less than MB, has this form. The important things here is that the first term I'm going to call the state counting term, it gives the maximum possible value. So this is log of the dimension, right? This is log of D to the NA. The other term I'll call the interference term. But what's important about it is that it's exponentially small in the difference between NA and NB. So if I'm away from the center of the page curve, I can approximate the page curve to equal the state counting term. So that's one thing you need to know. Second thing, it's a question I often get is, you know, where's the Hamiltonian? Well, here the Hamiltonian is unnecessary because we're capturing, we want to capture chaotic, non-integrable dynamics. And the way we can capture those dynamics without a Hamiltonian is by a random sampling of states. So if you don't have a Hamiltonian, well, how do you work in the conservation laws? Well, we just restrict the, sub, the Hilbert space. So I add a restriction to S, and that's how I introduce the conservation of the different symmetries into the problem. Okay, so that's what you need to know about page curves. We can now get into the analogous models. Right off the bat, I think it's legitimate to, to wonder, you know, do such models even exist? What does it mean to have analogous models that differ in whether their charges commute? How do you define analogousness in that sense? How do you construct such models? So these are questions we had. And so what we did is we came up with a list of criteria that were the, this most stringent criteria we could come up with. Uh, we don't have some argument that these are the most stringent criteria ever possible that anyone could ever come up with. This is the best we could do. I think we'd be excited to hear about opportunities to make it more robust or refine these further. So the first criteria is that we have the same physical setup. So the same number of sites, dimension of sites, and number of conserved charges. We want the charges to be extensive. This is natural, it makes things easier, and also it avoids issues of maybe hiding some difference in a difference of how the charges are, are distributed throughout your system. We want to have the, each of the charges have the same spectrum. So we want there to be the same possible outcomes. So here I have each non-commuting charge labeled as a Q with different subscripts alpha. So it'd be like Q1, Q2, Q3 total to indicate it's a global charge. And then with the commuting charges, I'll use C. It's not just enough to have the same outcomes. We want those same outcomes to occur with the same probabilities. So well, I'll denote the constrained subspaces with these script N and C. And the probability of measurement outcomes, I want those to be equal. That's what these P's are. The gammas are the possible outcomes. So for example, if I have three charges, gamma equals zero, 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 is that each charge's expectation value equals zero. And I'll be dealing with cases where there could also be different probabilities of different outcomes. So hence the distribution. So these first four criteria are pretty concrete and tangible. The last one is admittedly a bit more ambiguous. And that's that the charges have a similar algebra. What do I mean by similar? I think the best way to show that is with the example of, of our model. OK. So the analogous models, let's start constructing them. We start from the non-commuting picture, and we start with three charges. Because we, we're going to work with the simplest non-abelian symmetry, which is SU2. So we have three charges. Go to our commuting picture, we have three charges, so three restrictions per site, plus we add one for normalization. 
So then we have d uh, at least equals 4. So the simplest setup we can have is sites where we have pairs of qubits in each site. So the top row are the a qubits. The bottom row is the b qubits. We have n such pairs. So here I have an example outlined of the jth site. I'll use the superscripts with J in parentheses to denote some kind of local operator. So I have some non-commuting ones and commuting ones. I'll show you what they are. So for the non-commuting case, I have the poly matrices tensor the identity. And in the commuting case, I have the poly matrices tensor themselves. So the Qs don't commute, the Cs do. I then sum over these to get the global charges. So we can check the first three criterion really easily. We have the same C, same D and N, first criterion. We have extensive charges. This is explicit by the construction. And all these operators have the same eigenvalues. So one to three is pretty easy to check. We go to four, and this is the outcomes occur with the same probabilities. So I'm going to choose subspaces N and C such that this is the case. I want to have lots of examples, so we're going to have different subspaces. So the last criterion, we're going to have the algebraic structures. So this is the one that I've alluded to. For unequal indices, a product of any two charges equals the third times a constant. That's true in both cases. The difference is what that constant is. In the non-commuting case, the constant has a levi chavita symbol in it, so the order of operations matters. In the other one, it doesn't. This was the minimal change that we could come up with to introduce non-commutation, the kind of insertion of the levi chavita symbol here. For equal indices, a product of two of them equals the identity. So those are our models. I thought I'd just stop briefly to see if there's anything I can clarify about them because nothing else will make sense if they don't. Yeah, please. Yeah, so how can non-commuting charges exist? I'll give an example, like a simple setup. Say you have a spin chain. Three charges you would have there is say the, the Z component of the total spin, the X component and the Y component. If the total spin is conserved, each component will be uh, conserve, but those three components don't commute with one another. So a spin chain, I think, is like the simplest model where you have non-commuting charges. It's just, yeah, good question. Okay, great. Yeah, feel free to also stop me at other points or we can talk in breaks. Okay, so our first comparison we do in a microcanonical subspace. So you might be thinking, you know, Shannon, you just told me these things don't commute. You know, how can they share an eigenspace? You're full of it. But there is one special case, and that's the simultaneous eigenspace where you have the, the eigenvalue zero eigenspace of the non-commuting charges. So an intuition here is if the total uh, angular momentum is zero, then each component will be zero. We then go to the commuting model, and we set the eigenvalues there to all equal zero as well. Uh, this introduces a restriction that we have to have our number of sites be a multiple of four. And so in this case, we have both our probability distributions are just chronic or delta functions. So gamma equals zero, zero, zero in both cases. So we begin with a numerical comparison. The unrestricted page curve, I'll denote with this subscript with an H there. And the restricted one will have an S, either, an, well, S which can equal N or C, depending if it's the non-commuting or commuting case. So here, what these plots are showing is the difference between the unrestricted and the restricted page curve. That's on the y-axis, and across the x-axis is the subsystem, so NA. I only plot up to NA equals N divided by 2 um, because they're symmetric. So here what we find is that for all values of NA, the non-commuting page curve is greater. So that's numerics. And the biggest difference we find is in this N equals 4 case, 
Um, we have a difference of an eighth of a natural unit, which is about an almost 18% difference. And actually, you might be wondering why we only went to n equals eight. Remember, each site is two qubits. So we have eight qubits and 16 qubits, and we have to go on multiples of four sites. So the next option would be 24 qubits, which now gets hard to do with exact diagonalization. So those are the numerics. We also turn to analytically finding this difference. Recall that away from the center of the page curve, we can approximate the page curve with the state counting term. And we can use large n expansions and assuming that n a and n b are of the order n, so they're typical values, to calculate the page curve analytically. So for both the non-commuting and commuting model, we have the same leading order term l. So this is order n to the zero term. Then in the next order is where we see the difference. So the non-commuting case is the expression with the plus sign, and the commuting case is with the minus sign. So for all NA, the non-commuting page curve is higher. So here, it's one thing that's nice is that it decreases with 1 over N and not, say, exponentially, which gives us hope that this is something we can experimentally observe. So that was this uh, special microcanonical case. There's also another way we can study these using something called an approximate microcanonical subspace. So these approximate microcanonical or AMC subspaces, they're generalizations of microcanonical subspaces to accommodate non-commuting charges. So instead of having exact values, the charges have fairly well-defined values with some probability distribution. And the probability distribution is peaked and its variance grows slowly. In our cases, the variance doesn't grow with n at all. So it's very slow. So first, we have to identify analogous AMC subspaces. Give an overview here, a lot of the mathematical details and extra slides for those who are curious. But the idea of how we do this is, well, we have three non-commuting charges, so we can at least fix one of them. So let's pick Q3 total, and we fix it to have eigenvalues 2m. The two is just there was a thing for mathematical convenience. Well, we can fix the, the Z component of the spin. We can also fix the total spin. So we fix the total spin. And so we have another set of eigenvalues now, S. So with these two charges, they share an eigenspace labeled by S and M. So we go through is we go through all possible eigenspaces of S and M for the system sizes that we have, uh, have looked at numerically. And we see which one of them are AMC subspaces. So which one of them has probability distributions that are peaked and their variance grows slowly. So we identify all the possible AMC subspaces in the non-commuting model. We then go to the commuting model and we sum over microcanonical subspaces such that we get matching probability distributions. So we identify all the eigenspaces that satisfy this. Again, I'm happy to go through more details if people have questions. I have slides for that. What's important is that these are all the cases in which matching AMC subspaces existed. So we have the values of N, uh, here we have the values of S and M. So in all cases where we had matching AMC subspaces, S equaled M. And then I've listed here the values of the page curves for the non-commuting and the commuting models at their peaks. And so you can see that the difference, um, that the non-commuting models page curve is always higher. So for all pairs of analogous AMC subspaces, for all values of NA, the non-commuting page curve is greater. So to summarize, we isolated the effects of charges non-commutation on average entanglement. To do so, we found two models that are closely analogous, yet differ in whether their charges commute. We found that the non-commuting charge model has more entanglement on average. So for microcanonical subspaces, we did this analytically and numerically. And for the AMC subspace, we did it just numerically because the methods didn't transfer over exactly. Okay, the outlook, just a few things here I'm excited to share. One is, you know, this work raises a conceptual puzzle. And that's, does charges non-commutation hinder or enhance thermalization? One reason to think it enhances it is this work. So we've increased average entanglement and average entanglement, more entanglement tends to accompany thermalization. 
There's also, uh, it's been shown that non-commuting charges destabilize uh, a phase known as many body localization or MBL. MBL is a non-thermal phase, so it destabilizes a, a thermalization avoidant phase. Reasons to think it hinders it? Well, there's, I mentioned earlier that derivations often assume the charges commute. Well, the uh, charges non-commutation invalidates derivations of the thermal state's form. And then this point I mentioned in the beginning, it conflicts with the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and also reduces an entry production rate. I think it would be interesting to experimentally observe this difference in entanglement. So we need a precision of an eighth of a natural unit, and this has been achieved, for example, with trapped ion setups before. And here, this is, this is a lot, but I was hoping to cast a very, very wide net here to catch as many people as I can. So it'd be interesting to study the effects of thermodynamic charges non-computation on many different things. One is, let's say, on chaos. So something, say, measured in, with something like an out-of-time order correlation, so an OTOC. Um, do non-abelian symmetries make systems more or less chaotic? Product formula simulation errors. So I know people, a lot of people here have studied trotterization errors. If we have some extra detailed information about a Hamiltonian, it's symmetries. Well, if we know those symmetries are abelian or non-abelian, does that change our error threshold or the speed of the quantum simulations? There's questions related to quantum machine learning algorithms performance. So you look at something like VQE or Q, QAOA. People have studied these in the presence of symmetries. Do certain symmetries give you more or less of an advantage or make it harder or easier to, to perform the, the protocols? I think information loss in open quantum systems would be interesting. You take a qubit, you encode it in some system that's connected to the environment. Eventually, you're going to lose that quantum information. Eventually, it leaks out to the environment. Well, that system can have certain symmetries. Do certain symmetries protect that information more or less? That would be interesting to look at. People here have also studied hydrodynamic models. So here we can have some non-commuting charges in our system. I think there's been enough results that seem to suggest that the average values of the charges won't be affected by the non-abelian symmetries, but the fluctuations may. And that might have interesting questions related to metrology. And then finally, on quantum thermodynamic devices. So I mentioned, for example, heat engines earlier. Well, what's the effect of symmetries on heat engine performance? So again, lots of different ways to, to model our, our working medium. There can be many different thermal baths we can connect it to, and the coupling between those can have different symmetries. Are there any advantages to non-abelian symmetries, or is it a hindrance in those cases? I think one reason this last one's particularly exciting is the reduction of entry production result. Can we leverage that in heat engines? So I want to thank you guys for this. Uh, thank everyone for listening. These are my collaborators, Alexander Lasek, David Hughes, Nicole Younger Halpern. The first paper is the one I spoke about. I listed two others. The, the top bullet there is on SU2 symmetric monitored quantum circuits, just because I noticed a few posters on monitored quantum circuits. So I thought people might be interested in that. And this last one, I'm, I'm pretty happy to finally get to, to share. People often ask, is there a review on non commuting charges? If I just want to read one paper and get caught up on the field, I can finally say, yes, there is. It's this last one here. So thanks, and I'll, I'll take questions. Yeah, so the way we construct it is that we'll, in the numerical case, so we have like a simultaneous, um, like the eigenspace for those states. And so with the commuting charges, you can get a separable basis, and the non commuting charges, you can't. So we just numerically find those, those basis states. So we like solve for the, um, for the charges. Are you 
Yeah, so with the, so let's say, let's start with the microcanonical case. So there we have a simultaneous eigenspace of all of them. So we can have, um, you know, simultaneous eigenstates for each of those, right? And then, so what we do when we construct the Haar random states is each time we'll, we'll draw every one of those basis states and we construct a superposition of those with like a complex Gaussian amplitude that's randomly chosen. With the AMC subspaces, it's a bit different. So we can choose states that are simultaneous eigenstates of the Z and the total one. And then we do the same process after that. We do a superposition of all of them with different complex amplitudes. Yeah. Yeah, so preparing, so you're asking like, how would you prepare these like uh, very, um, I guess, random states as your initial states? Because preparing car random states is difficult. Right. So I think the the part that I'd have to um, we have to figure out is the the initial state prepara preparation. That's the part that I'm not sure of. I don't know the literature as well to necessarily say how you prepare those initial states. Um, maybe after I'll comment on the dynamics, but maybe someone else will have thought about the initial states. But then after we have that, so we have um, some conservation law that you can then go from your conservation laws. You can construct a Hamiltonian. So we have a procedure that we came up with two years ago that you choose your system, say it's like, you know, you have n sites, you choose your symmetries. So you say, okay, I want to conserve these charges. And then you say, okay, I want nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor coupling. I want two body interaction, three body interaction, whatever. And that procedure will give you the Hamiltonian to then go and do the experiment. So the, the dynamics part of it, we have like a procedure for constructing that in terms of generating random initial states. I understand that that's, experimentally difficult to do and that there's different i think with different hardwares different approaches people have used uh, to do that and so i guess um yeah like that'll be like the piece we'd have to, to figure out together what's kind of most suitable for that but the hamiltonian and the dynamics part that we have figured out yeah thanks yeah Yeah, so one thing with the those like non abelian gauge theories is that you have like a local symmetry and a lot of the questions we've looked at you have like a global symmetry and then the charges are moving around locally so i haven't thought a lot yet about how these results translate over to um to these cases like with these local cases but in that review document there is a, a piece that comments on on uh non abelian um on like local symmetries Yeah, Iman. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's another piece I can add to the slide. I feel each time I give the talk, the Outlook slide gets like one more piece on it. So that's good. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So if you want to think about it as like, so you have your pair of qubits. There's nothing that could stop you from thinking about that as like a four level system though, right? And then you have like a single qubit. And then if you go to the qubit picture, then that difference doesn't um, show up in some way. Like you don't have any site that you're acting on in a trivial way. So the, the local operators do act non-trivially on each site. I think the qubit picture can make it look like there is some trivial action going on there. But if you look at it from, if you consider like a four level qubit, then that goes away. So even with like the operator, X, like the polys tensor the identity, 
the constraint on those on, on a pair of qubits is very different than having the constraint of X on one qubit and then the identity necessarily on the other. Uh, you, you do get some, um, Okay, I guess to answer your question, no, and no, and the way to to see that it's not the case is if you just imagine it as a four level Q to it. That I'm not sure about, but. Um, Yeah, so I guess, okay, the, an explanation for like why we see the effect wasn't something that we came to, like we didn't have like a, an analytic argument for like why there's this increase in average entanglement entropy. There was like one argument that with the non-commuting model, the minimally entangled basis is still entangled, where at the commuting model, the minimally entangled basis is separable. So that, that could be an explanation for it. Um, but I think the, the resolution to the, okay, are you acting trivially on, on some of your sites? The resolution to that would be no, just because uh, each site, you don't ever have the identity operator fully on a single site. And so from, from the four level system picture, the restriction does apply on each site. Yeah, but I think, I, like I said, a, a good, I think, opportunity for future work is refining these criteria. Like, is there a way to come up with something more stringent and more tight and see like, how does that affect uh, the results? Right. So there isn't like a, a trivial way to just make the commuting charges become non-commuting. Like it's not like a tunable parameter we have. So if we want to go and say, like to answer your question, if you take the commuting charges and make them non-commuting, I think you just have the same model um, because these are like the minimal difference we could find between these two. So I don't think there's like a, there isn't some other analogous non-commuting model that I know of as well, that it would be like a, like a triplet of models, let's say. Do I have time for another? Yeah. 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 So, oh, yeah. Uh, so if you uh, relax one of the criteria, would that change your results or would that change the models? So I think you could, you know, we didn't look at other models with only subsets of the criteria. Um, I think if you did, you could presumably get other models, but at least, you know, the first four models, I mean, the first four criteria we think are necessary to argue that the models are analogous. Like if you remove any one of them, um, then you have like some way that th these models can differ apart from charges non-commutation. And then the fifth uh, criteria is the introducing the difference. So if you remove that one, then you could have two non commuting models or two commuting models. So th there may be ways to, I think, add more criteria or to make some of the criteria maybe tighter potentially. Um, but I think removing them would lead to less analogous models. Yeah. So I think the challenge is like trying to find other models. So we're not sure. This is the first time where we could, or the first attempt of trying to isolate for the effects of charges non-commutation. I think things like finding, say, like families of models would be super interesting. Um, so that way we could go and like probe these results further. But right now we just have like these two models to work from. But hopefully this is a step forward for, for finding other models too. <laughs> 